In the vast vacuum of space in Universe 7, hundreds of impact explosions and vibrational waves can be seen simultaneously as various celestial bodies are destroyed. Amidst all these displays of power, two types of energy can be observed, one with a white color and the other with a purple color. As streaks of light, two bodies move at extraordinary speeds, colliding multiple times, and with each collision, a gigantic wave of impact is generated. But at one moment, an even stronger collision occurs, producing an impact wave so powerful that it momentarily alters the perception of reality. After this last clash, the bodies come to a halt, facing each other for a few seconds. And it is in this moment that we can see who these two combatants are, Goku and Vegeta. However, they don't appear as we usually see them. Goku has an older appearance, as if decades have passed since the last time we saw him in Dragon Ball Super. Vegeta, on the other hand, seems to maintain the same age but wears a very different attire, the attire of a god of destruction. But it's not just their appearances that have changed. They are utilizing a transformation we've never seen before. In this transformation, both have longer hair, fur spread across their bodies, and a tail. Goku's hair and fur are white, while Vegeta's hair and fur are purple. After the collision and momentarily stop their movements, they begin to move again, but this time exchanging blows at such an intense speed that only their blurred figures can be seen. Amidst this exchange of blows, they each land a punch to the other's face, causing them to stagger backwards. Despite being heavily wounded and panting, they smile. Vegeta praises his rival, stating that despite his advanced age, Goku still manages to surpass himself more and more. Goku replies saying that he will continue to evolve even further. Vegeta suggests that he and Kakarot settle this with one final blow, and he begins to gather an intense amount of energy in one of his hands. Goku agrees with the proposal and decides to do the same. Goku and Vegeta fly towards each other, both emanating an immensely powerful amount of energy in their hands. At that moment, Whis arrives flying and shouts for them to stop immediately, but it's too late. The Saiyan's fists collide and a massive explosion of light ensues. When the light dissipates, Goku and Vegeta are no longer there. Whis closes his eyes and sighs, wondering how a seemingly simple argument could escalate to this level. To understand what happened, let's go back a few hours in time. It was another ordinary day on Beerus's planet, except for one thing. Beerus was finally waking up from a long slumber. He woke up thanks to the collision of two alarms scattered in his room, which exploded. As Beerus awakened, Whis, who heard the alarm explosion, enters his room. The presence of the angel surprises Beerus a bit, as he didn't expect Whis to be on the planet. Beerus asks how long he slept, and Whis responds that he slept for a long 30 years. Even after finding out he slept for three decades, Beerus isn't entirely satisfied, as he would have liked to have slept for at least 50 years. But Whis tells him that he shouldn't sleep so much anymore, since he's no longer immortal and his lifespan is passing. Beerus says it's alright, as despite no longer being immortal, one of the characteristics of his race is that he can live for millennia. And according to his calculations, he still has at least 5,000 years ahead of him. As Beerus stretches, he mentions that he wants to exercise his body a bit, and he asks Whis to accompany him on a walk around the planet. Whis obeys his request. While they walk around the planet, Beerus asks why Whis isn't on Earth. Since he's an angel, he should be there guiding the God of Destruction. Whis responds that he was with the God of Destruction until a few days ago on a work campaign across the universe. But after the campaign ended, the Hakaishin decided to take a few days off, and tired of the angel's presence, ordered him to return to Beerus' planet. Beerus asks if Whis bought any food from Earth, and he says yes. However, someone already ate all the food. Beerus becomes furious and asks who could have eaten all the food. Whis laughs and asks him to go to the other side of the planet to see something. Beerus does as Whis says, and is shocked when he sees a small house in one of the planet's gardens, and inside the house are Brawly, Chilai, and Lemo. Seeing that he's awake, Brawly greets the lazy cat, but Beerus is not in a good mood, and asks what they're doing there. Whis explains that since Beerus went to sleep, the trio stayed on the planet and decided to build a house. Goku and Vegeta invited them to live on Earth, and Brawly even tried for a while, but he didn't adapt well to a planet with so many people and things going on, so he decided to stay there. Beerus was about to complain a lot about all of this, but when he catches the smell of the food Lemo is cooking, it calms his heart a little. However, when he sees Chilai's beautiful face, he's completely convinced to let them stay. Despite the many years that have passed, Lemo and Chilai haven't aged much, surely a racial characteristic of theirs. Although fearing Beerus, Lemo and Chilai are happy that he is awake and suggest having a feast to celebrate his awakening and reunite everyone. Their idea is to invite Goku and Vegeta for a dinner on the planet later. Incredibly, Beerus agrees, saying he's curious to see how those two idiots are after all this time. He asks Whis what they've been doing all these years. Whis says they've been doing the same thing they did before, training a lot. Beerus smiles and says those two will never change. Whis says that they have actually changed a lot. They are much more powerful, and they'll surely surprise him. 
Beerus says he can't wait to see them. Vegeta is in the garden of the Capsule Corporation, silently gazing at the sky when Bulma approaches him to talk. She asks why he looks so contemplative, and Vegeta replies that during his last war campaign, across the universe, he had to destroy many planets and civilizations. Bulma asks if he feels guilty about it, and he says he doesn't feel exactly guilty since he did what he had to do, and everything he destroyed had a justification. The fact that he's still doing his job with well-established criteria has greatly improved Universe 7, unlike how it was with Beerus. But despite all that, despite doing his job with maximum fairness and the universe benefiting from it, he still feels some discomfort with what he does. To cheer her husband up, Bulma invites him to see Trunks and Bulla, but their plans are interrupted when Whis arrives at the scene. Vegeta asks what he wants and says their days off are not over yet, but Whis explains he's not there for work. He tells them that Beerus woke up and invited him and Goku to a feast on his planet. Vegeta smiles and says that the lazy cat has finally woken up. He agrees to go since it's been 30 years since he last saw his master. Whis is pleased and Vegeta agreed and then asks where Goku is. Meanwhile, in a parallel universe, the Goku from Dragon Ball GT has just transformed into Super Saiyan 4, emanating an absurd amount of power. He has a smile on his face and tells the person he's facing that he will now attack with all his power. The person standing before him is the elder Goku, who watches his parallel version with a friendly smile. Super Saiyan 4 Goku attacks by unleashing a sequence of rapid and powerful strikes. However, the old Goku demonstrates surprising agility, effortlessly dodging the attacks of Super Saiyan 4 with graceful and precise movements. Realizing that his physical attacks are ineffective, Super Saiyan 4 Goku decides to use his special techniques. First, he pretends to attempt a physical blow against the old Goku, but as he gets closer, he uses the Taioken, an intense flash of light intended to blind his opponent. He uses the technique hoping that momentary blindness could destabilize his opponent and make him vulnerable to his attacks. Then he launches a Kianzan to cut him, but the old Goku displays unmatched mastery and effortlessly deflects the Kianzan with a smooth movement. Even with his eyes closed due to the intense light that blinded them, the old Goku maintains a tranquil smile. He says he could have escaped from the Taioken, but he chose not to because he doesn't need his eyes to fight. His knowledge of his own body is so advanced that he can perceive through all his senses. Feeling increasingly frustrated, Super Saiyan 4 Goku gathers all his energy into a Kamehameha multiplied by 10 and unleashes a massive wave of power that has enough energy to obliterate an entire dimension if he desires. But to his absolute shock, the old Goku simply points one of his hands upward and then his telekinetic force diverts the trajectory of the energy, sending it far into the sky away from them. Younger Goku is completely shocked by this, so surprised that he can't even move for a moment. The moment is more than enough for the older Goku to approach and touch a point on his neck with his finger. With this simple and even gentle touch from an older warrior, the younger man loses his transformation and reverts to the form of a child. Child Goku asks how he can be so powerful and the older Goku responds that for many years he decided to focus not only on massive power gains but also on enhancing his inner knowledge. That's how he achieved this power that he considered unimaginable in the past. Young Goku smiles and thanks him for the tip. Afterwards, he faints exhausted. Thus the battle ended, teaching a lesson of humility and self-improvement to the younger version of Goku. But the older Goku is not as content. He sighs, slightly frustrated to have won another fight so easily. At that moment, Vegeta and Whis arrive thanks to Vegeta's instant transmission. Goku is surprised and asks what they are doing there. Vegeta says Kakarot went to a very distant world this time, and he almost couldn't find him. Goku comments that it has been five years since he has been traveling through these infinite parallel worlds in search of a worthy rival, but it's been very difficult to find one. Whis explains why they came, inviting Goku to a feast on Beerus' planet. It's only at this moment that Goku realizes how hungry he is, and obviously agrees. Later on Beerus' planet, everyone is gathered around a large table, being served by Chilai and Lemo. Beerus wants to know what they have been doing during all these years. In Brawly's case, things have been a bit more monotonous. He has spent his years alone on this planet with Chilai and Lemo, occasionally training. He has also had some training sessions with Goku and Vegeta, but nothing too enduring. Vegeta recalls that after the events involving Granola and the Heaters, he continued his training with Beerus until he and Whis deemed him ready to become the next god of destruction. After his ascension as a Hakaishin, Beerus retired and went to sleep, and during that time, Vegeta has trained extensively and carried out his duties as a god. Goku says that he dedicated all his years exclusively to training, and since he attained the supreme ability, he's been traveling through many worlds in search of a good fight. Beerus becomes curious when Goku mentions attaining the 
supreme ability, and asks what he means by that. Goku responds that he is referring to the Shinken. Upon hearing this, Beerus is completely shocked, involuntarily spitting out the soda he was drinking. He can't believe that Goku has achieved something like that. But Whis confirms it and says that Vegeta has also achieved it. Beerus can't believe it. But before he can learn more, the conversation is interrupted when Goku and Vegeta reach the last piece of meat. At that moment, the two Saiyans start arguing, both wanting the meat. Goku argues that Vegeta is a god and doesn't need to eat, unlike him. But Vegeta argues that Goku has to know his place as a mortal, and should not dictate what a god should or shouldn't do. Seeing that it's a stalemate, Whis suggests that they resolve it the way Saiyans do best, through a battle. Naturally, both of them agree. Whis takes them to an isolated region of the universe and says he will isolate a vast region of space so they can fight however they want. He forms a massive force field that isolates thousands of light years of distance. Inside this force field, there is only vacuum and some lifeless celestial bodies. The only persons there are Goku, Vegeta, Whis, and Beerus. Goku and Vegeta transform, assuming their special forms. Feeling the power of those forms that he has never seen before, Beerus asks how they've reached that level of power. Whis responds that both have attained the Shinken, the supreme technique that almost no god or angel has been able to achieve. And when they reach that level of understanding, their bodies found new forms, which embody the full power of their essence. It's a transcendent level. Whis explains that Vegeta's supreme form manifested by incorporating the power of Hakai, while Goku's supreme form manifested by incorporating the power of Ultra Instinct. Their conversation is interrupted when the two Saiyans finally initiate the battle, launching themselves at each other with a sequence of extremely powerful strikes. The sound impact of their exchanges resonate through the vacuum of space, creating a deafening symphony. Their fighting abilities are at their peak, and their movements are so complex that they hardly seem real. It doesn't take long for the results of this battle between two transcendent beings to extend beyond physical space. The fabric of reality begins to distort, creating dimensional rifts around them. They are tampering with the very laws of the universe, pushing the boundaries of what is possible. Goku's power is like a white hurricane, while Vegeta's power is like a purple storm. Their energies collide constantly, creating cataclysmic explosions that echo through the cosmos. They move so fast that they seem to be everywhere at once. Witnessing that insane battle, Beerus can't believe the level of power those two possess, and he states that they've even surpassed him. Whis confirms it and says, it's been the case for a few years now. The former god of destruction becomes somewhat frustrated by this and wonders if he could defeat them if he were still at his peak, or if he had continued training all those years. The white and purple light emanating from them begins to merge, creating a multicolored aura that illuminates the space around them. As the attacks intensify, a titanic force is unleashed, tearing through space-time as it propagates. New dimensions form and dissolve around them. Beerus and Whis start to become concerned about the outcome of this battle and Beerus asks if it's truly safe. Worriedly, Whis says that despite the force field he created, things are getting a bit out of control. Goku and Vegeta concentrate a massive amount of power and unleash it. The collision of their attacks creates an immeasurable shockwave that transverses Universe 7. It is so powerful that all living beings in the universe feel the impact, and even in other universes, that energy can be sensed. It is at this moment that Whis decides he can't let the fight continue, because they've already gone too far. But they moved away too much, so the angel needs to hurry to stop them. However, before Whis can reach them, Goku and Vegeta clash their blows, charged with immense power, and then they disappear in an explosion of light. Whis laments that it has come to this point and wonders how much a simple argument could escalate to this level. When the explosion of light subsides, Goku and Vegeta realize that they are on Beerus' planet. Both of them are very confused by this and revert their transformations. Beerus and Whis immediately approach them, greatly surprised by the explosion of light that just occurred. But to their surprise, Beerus points his hand at them while charging a significant amount of destruction energy and orders them to reveal who they are, or else he will completely destroy them. Goku and Vegeta are in complete shock, wondering what the hell is happening. With his hand pointed at Goku and Vegeta gathering a great amount of destruction energy, Beerus asks who they are and what they want on his planet. Goku and Vegeta are very surprised by this, but Goku starts to think that Beerus is joking and tries to approach him with a smile and a relaxed tone. But Beerus proves he wasn't joking by firing all the energy in the form of a small power sphere. Goku dodges it while getting a big scare, and after avoiding the attack, he sees the small power sphere pass right through him, move away from the planet, and disappear in a massive explosion in the sky that shakes the entire planet. At that moment, Goku realized that Beerus is truly serious, and he screams in fear because the God of Destruction really tried to kill him. Vegeta asks Beerus and Whis what is happening, and tells them that they are Goku and Vegeta, their disciples, but the Destroyer and the Angel seem to have no idea what they're talking about. 
Wiz says that he hasn't had a student since Beerus himself, and Beerus never had a disciple. Noticing Vegeta's attire more closely, Beerus asks why he's dressed like a god of destruction, and at that moment he comically gets angry, creating a theory in his mind, and coming to the conclusion that Vegeta is there to try to take his position. Vegeta comically gets scared when the god of destruction suggests that and tries to say that's not what's happening. But before he could explain the situation, Beerus is already in front of him, hitting him with a very strong punch to the abdomen. A punch so strong that it immediately leaves Vegeta out of breath while letting his saliva come out of his mouth. After the punch to the abdomen, Beerus lands another one right on Vegeta's face, sending the Saiyan Prince high up in the sky and making him disappear. Goku comically gets scared and also tries to approach Beerus and tells him that things are not as he is thinking. But without even responding or letting him speak, Beerus points his hand and unleashes a massive wave of power against Goku, which would hit him right in the head. But he comically dodges it by throwing his body backward to the point of hitting his head on the ground. After the wave of power passes over him, Goku stands up in great fear and complains to the destroyer saying that the attack was launched with the intent to kill him. Beerus says that's obvious since killing them is his intention because he was sleeping and was awakened by the noise made by these two, so they will pay with their lives for it. Beerus charges towards Goku and attempts an attack, but Goku dodges and goes up into the sky. The God of Destruction pursues him with many other attacks, all of which Goku comically dodges while trying to explain to Beerus that they don't want to harm him. Beerus gets very irritated that Goku is dodging his blows and tells him to stand still. While this is happening, Whis watches very attentively, surprised that Goku is dodging Beerus' attacks and realizing that it's not normal. Whis realizes that despite Goku looking like an idiot, he certainly isn't one. At one point, Beerus tries to punch Goku, and seeing that the blow would actually hit him, Goku defends himself by gently deflecting Beerus' arm and making a move that causes the God of Destruction to pass right through him, spinning several times in the air and heading towards the ground. Before crashing into the ground, Beerus manages to regain control of his body and land, but he is very angry about what just happened. After Goku's move, Whis is completely impressed, and he tells Beerus that he better take this fight seriously seriously and not underestimate his opponent because Goku is using Ultra Instinct. Beerus is shocked by these words and asks Whis if he's sure about what he's saying. Whis says yes and that he had been suspecting it from the beginning, but after seeing Goku's last move, he's certain. Goku says that Whis is as sharp as ever and confirms the angel's suspicions, saying that he is indeed using Ultra Instinct. After so many years of training, Goku managed to learn what he was training in the Granola Arc, which is to use Ultra Instinct fully as a technique without the need to transform. Whis asks how Goku learned Ultra Instinct and he replies that it was Whis himself who taught him. But before they could continue the conversation, they see a flash of energy approaching through the sky at high speed. And this energy is not just any energy, but the purple energy of destruction, who's approaching is Vegeta, who has transformed into Ultra Ego and goes straight towards the God of Destruction, shocking Beerus completely. The shock is so great that Beerus can't even react and then he's hit by a flying kick from Vegeta that sends him to the other side of the planet, leaving behind a gigantic trail of destruction on the ground. Goku becomes desperate with Vegeta's reaction and tells him that they should be trying to convince the two instead of starting a real fight. But Vegeta says he doesn't care. Beerus really hurt him with those attacks, and no one hits him like that and gets away with it. On the other side of the planet, a large pillar of purple energy can be seen in the distance, and floating out of that energy is the God of Destruction of the Universe 7, surrounded by an aura of destructive energy and with a furious expression. Beerus flies out from where he was, and in a split second returns to where Vegeta is, landing on the ground with such force that it creates a hole around the area of impact. Furious, he asks how Vegeta is able to use that power. At first, he thought Vegeta was a fake wearing that God of Destruction outfit, but he seems that's not the case. On the other hand, Vegeta can't be the god of another universe since Beerus knows them all. He asks who Vegeta really is. Vegeta responds that it was Beerus himself who taught him the technique and that he is the god of destruction of Universe 7. Beerus laughs and says that Vegeta must be crazy. It's as was said. He never had a disciple and he has no intention of having one. Beerus also states that he is the god of Universe 7 and doesn't intend to give that position to anyone. Beerus increases the intensity of his power aura and Vegeta does the same. They stare at each other with determination as their intense auras envelop the entire battlefield. Goku was about to ask Vegeta to not fight again, but he didn't have time to do so because Vegeta lunged forward with a quick push towards the God of Destruction. However, Beerus skillfully dodged, demonstrating his feline agility. He retaliated with a series of swift kicks. Vegeta was hit by the first few kicks, but managed to block the rest and counterattack with a powerful elbow strike to Beerus' chin, making him recoil. But Beerus quickly recovered, and they continued their exchange of blows. The fight continued with both combatants displaying great strength, speed, and skill, a battle worthy of two martial arts masters. 
Due to the more aggressive nature of his Ultra Ego, Vegeta focused on a more offensive tactic, investing in brutal attacks and not caring about taking some hits from his opponent to create an opening. Beerus, on the other hand, employed a more balanced approach, attempting precise and swift strikes while evading the enemy's attacks with agility. However, despite this smoother strategy, the Destroyer didn't shy away from employing force and violence in his blows. Each movement was calculated and executed masterfully, maintaining the balance between them. Goku noticed that despite using the power of destruction to inflict greater damage, Beerus also seemed to be utilizing Ultra Instinct in his movements, which were incredibly fluid and precise. Goku remembered that during the exhibition match against the other gods of destruction, Beerus employed a similar tactic effectively handling the attacks of the other gods while also delivering powerful strikes. However, Goku compared the two instances and concluded that Beerus seemed to be executing it much better now, as if he had trained extensively to balance these two concepts. The planet of Beerus trembled under the intensity of the confrontation, and with each collision of the two gods of destruction's attacks, there were climatic anomalies like earthquakes, gusts of wind, and lightning. Despite Vegeta's fierce resistance, Beerus began to gain a slight edge in the fight. With his smooth and precise movements, Beerus landed some impactful strikes in the right place, shaking the Saiyan Prince. But Vegeta seemed to feed off the pain from the blows, further strengthening his combat instinct and consequently his body. With his vigor increased, he began to outshine Beerus, pressing him and landing some powerful attacks on the Cat God as well. At one point, Vegeta was about to deliver a strong punch to Beerus, which would undoubtedly cause a great deal of pain. But Beerus prevented the blow by pointing his hand at Vegeta and firing a massive wave of energy at point blank rage, pushing him away. Infuriated, Vegeta began shooting multiple energy blasts at Beerus, who skillfully evaded by maneuvering through the air with agility, responding with the same type of attack. Beerus and Vegeta engaged in a true shootout of ki blasts, creating explosions and shockwaves that shook the planet. Multiple explosions scattered across the sky of Beerus's planet as they skillfully dodged attacks and countered with increasingly powerful techniques. The battle turned into a spectacle of light and power as Vegeta and Beerus unleashed a relentless sequence of attacks. Vegeta decided to change attacks and unleashed a powerful Gallic gun while Beerus retaliated with a devastating energy sphere. The collision of the two powers created an explosion that made all the previous explosions seem like nothing. After the Gallic gun, the Saiyan decided to resort to an even more powerful technique, concentrating a tremendous amount of power and unleashing his final flash, releasing a massive torrent of energy towards Beerus, who responded with a colossal destruction sphere. Seeing what was about to happen, Whis created a force field around himself, while Goku immediately used instant transmission. The collision of the attacks was so violent that it created an extraordinary explosion of energy, obliterating the entire surface of the planet. After the catastrophic explosion, Whis felt safe enough to dispel his force field, and Goku, who had teleported away to escape the blast, returned to the planet relieved. Beerus and Vegeta finally paused for a moment, panting as they locked eyes. Beerus smiled and admitted that Vegeta was no ordinary warrior, and indeed he possessed enough power to be a true god of destruction. Vegeta replied that he already was one, but it still felt good for his pride to hear such praise from someone like Beerus. The two were about to continue, but then Whis shouted for Beerus to look at his planet. Only now did Beerus see the devastation that had occurred, and he was shocked to realize that his entire planet lay in ruins. He grew furious and yelled at Vegeta, saying that he would pay for what he had forced him to do. Vegeta retorted that Beerus had no right to complain since he had been the one responsible for the destruction of his planet in the past. But at that moment, Goku surprised everyone by arriving behind Vegeta, touching his shoulder and then teleporting them away. Beerus grew furious and asked Whis where they had gone, but Whis simply gestured, indicating that he didn't know. Goku and Vegeta were teleported to a desolate planet. Vegeta asked Goku where he had taken them, and Goku replied that he had sent some energy there and brought them to that location. Apparently, there was no intelligent life on this planet, but Goku must have sensed the key of some animal or insect, which in his current state of developing his ability to sense key was enough. Vegeta was very angry as he reverted to his base form. He asked why Kakarot had prevented him from continuing the fight. Goku said that he and Beerus were taking the fight too seriously, and they should be focused on finding out what had happened, not killing their friends. Vegeta said that he was going to kill Beerus just to teach him a lesson, but Goku argued that there was no way for him to know that. For some reason, this Beerus seemed different from the one they knew. This Beerus seemed more evolved, and Goku was sure that he hadn't been using his full power in that fight. If he and Vegeta continued fighting, they would take it more and more seriously and reach the point of killing each other or destroying the entire universe. Goku jokingly said that Vegeta and Beerus were quite similar, both very temperamental and prideful, always taking things too seriously. Vegeta reluctantly agreed with Goku and said that this Beerus he had just faced was different from the Beerus he knew. This Beerus didn't just use enough power in that fight to surpass the full power of the Beerus he knew. 
So he couldn't say if he was stronger or not, but what he could say for sure was that he had a much more refined fighting technique. Vegeta remarked that it felt as if Beerus he knew was a rusty version compared to the Beerus he had just faced. Goku suggested that if this Beerus had improved his combat techniques compared to the Beerus they knew, it might be because he had time to do so. This could mean that they had somehow been transported to the future. Vegeta said that couldn't be the case, because if this were a future version of Beerus, he would still know them. But Vegeta agreed with Goku that they might be in some parallel timeline, such as Trunks' timeline. Goku said they could go to Earth, as there, they would have a better understanding of things. Vegeta agreed and said it was a good idea. Goku and Vegeta focused for a moment, identifying the location of planet Earth, and then teleported themselves there. Goku and Vegeta arrived on planet Earth, specifically at Capsule Corporation. Looking around, they noticed that Capsule Corporation doesn't seem different from what they know, but they see something that leaves them both in extreme shock. Walking through the garden of Capsule Corporation are Yamcha and Bulma, and that's not all. They are embracing each other like a couple. Upon seeing this, Vegeta is completely paralyzed for a moment, appearing not to be alive anymore. But in the next moment, the life of the Saiyan Prince returns, erupting in a burst of fury as he screams at Yamcha with all his might to get his hands off his Bulma. His voice is so piercing that it makes the entire place tremble. Yamcha and Bulma are taken aback as they hadn't noticed that there were other people there. Yamcha and Bulma ask who they are, but it's Vegeta who wants to ask the questions. He wants to know why the hell they are together like that. Yamcha says that Bulma is his wife, and this is their house, and he also says that they are the ones in the wrong in this situation, so they shouldn't be asking questions. Upon hearing that Yamcha and Bulma are a couple, Goku and Vegeta are even more surprised, and Vegeta's anger seems to increase as well. He tells Yamcha to get away from his wife, or he'll make him disappear in an instant. Goku pleads with Vegeta to calm down, but he refuses to do so. He only wants to kill the bastard. Yamcha displays a proud smile, and while puffing up his chest in a posture of superiority, says that they have no idea who they're talking to. He says they are talking to Yamcha, one of the great heroes of Earth. Vegeta says that Yamcha is a hero only in hell, which is where he will send him now. Without hesitation, he fires an energy blast at Yamcha, who is caught off guard by the sudden attack. But before a tragedy occurs, Goku points one hand at the energy sphere and then points the other to the sky. As he does this, Vegeta's energy vanishes from there, only to reappear in the sky and finally explode. The power of the explosion shakes the entire place, leaving Yamcha and Bulma completely frightened. Goku scolds Vegeta saying that he would have destroyed the entire Capsule Corporation with that, and even killed Bulma. Vegeta appears remorseful for what he has done, but justifies it by saying that he simply couldn't hold back his rage. Yamcha says that they will pay for that, and then begins to concentrate his power as he releases an aura of energy. Goku and Vegeta are surprised because they realize that Yamcha's power is truly immense compared to what they know. Goku asks how Yamcha became so powerful, and he responds by saying that he warned them not to provoke him, and then he threatens the two, saying that they will pay for invading his house like that. Yamcha says he will start with Vegeta and charges at him in a low flight, saying that he will claim his life. But Goku quickly resolves the situation by moving behind Yamcha with enough speed that he doesn't even have time to react, and knocks him out with a gentle blow to the neck. Seeing her husband being defeated so effortlessly, Bulma becomes completely terrified and asks how he did it. Goku jokes and says that despite this Yamcha may be thousands of times more powerful than the one they know, he still doesn't compare to them. Goku also says that he had to do it for his own safety, as Vegeta would have surely torn the guy to shreds if Yamcha had gotten any closer. After justifying himself, Goku asks Bulma if they can talk now, and she has no choice but to agree. After what happened, Bulma called the other Earth warriors and asked them to come to her house. A short time later, they were all there, gathered around a large table in the garden. In addition to Goku, Vegeta, Bulma, and Yamcha, Krillin, Tien, and Piccolo were also present. Goku and Vegeta explain the situation to everyone, telling them that they apparently came from a parallel timeline, but in this world things are different. After explaining their story to everyone, they asked the others to tell them what had happened on Earth in their absence. In this world, Goku never arrived on planet Earth, so they had no knowledge of his existence. In this world, Bulma also went after the Dragon Balls. On that journey, she met Yamcha and they fell in love and eventually got married. Goku asks how she obtained the four-star Dragon Ball if he wasn't there to give it to her, and she explains that Son Gohan was very kind and gave her the Dragon Ball. Goku then remembers that he was the one who killed his grandfather, so if he had never come to Earth, Son Gohan would be alive at the time Bulma went after the Dragon Balls. Bulma says that in this world, Son Gohan died just a few years ago, and his death was natural due to old age. In this world, Krillin also became a disciple of Master Roshi, and they participated in the 21st World Martial Arts Tournament, in which Master Roshi disguised himself as Jackie Chun and became the champion. The Red Ribbon Army also attempted to dominate the world and came very close to succeeding, but Master 
Master Roshi, Krillin, and Yamcha join forces to put an end to the evil organization. Sometime later, the 22nd World Martial Arts Tournament took place, and Tien was the winner. But he was convinced by Master Roshi to become a better person and gave up his plans of becoming an assassin. After the tournament, King Piccolo and his minions initiated their plans, and they even killed Krillin, Chiaotzu, and Master Roshi. But Yamcha and Tien trained hard, and they had the help of Son Gohan who wanted to fight despite being retired because he wanted to avenge his master's death. While Yamcha and Son Gohan dealt with Piccolo's minions, Tien managed to defeat the Great Demon King with the Mafuba, which he learned from watching Master Roshi. A few years later, King Piccolo's son appeared in the 23rd World Martial Arts Tournament, but Kami-sama, foreseeing this, called Tien, Yamcha, and Krillin to train on the Celestial Platform a few years earlier. When Piccolo Jr. arrived to face them, the three joined forces and defeated him. Goku asks how Piccolo survived the fight since, in his world, it was he who spared his life. Piccolo explains that the Earth Warriors didn't want to kill him at that time because they didn't want Kami-sama to die as well. However, after he was defeated in the tournament, Kami-sama used the Mafuba to seal him, and they kept him in prison for many years. Vegeta asks if they encountered any Saiyans in this world, and they responded that they didn't. Vegeta expected the answer as if Goku never arrived on Earth. It's probably because he wasn't sent there, so Raditz had no reason to come to that planet, and consequently neither did he or Nappa. Knowing that the Saiyans didn't appear in this world, Goku concluded that they probably didn't go to Namek either, since the reason they went there is his world was to resurrect their fallen comrades from the Saiyan invasion. They confirm Goku's suspicions, saying that they never went to a place called Namek. Goku asks if they had any trouble with androids, and they reply that they did. They explain that long after they destroyed the Red Ribbon Army, a remnant of that organization named Dr. Gero created incredibly powerful androids to defeat them. Vegeta asks how they managed to defeat these androids, since in their world, the Saiyans were crucial to that victory. They explain that when the androids attacked and they realized they wouldn't be able to defeat them, Kami-sama told them about the hyperbolic time chamber, and they all trained there for many days, which amounted to many years. Even with all that training, they still wouldn't be able to surpass the androids, but Kami-sama decided to sacrifice his own individuality and merge with Piccolo, and their power increased tremendously. Up until that point, Piccolo was trapped, but he was freed for this purpose. With Kami-sama residing within him, he retained his consciousness, but also inherited some of Kami's calmer personality. Piccolo became powerful enough to face the androids, so the others only supported him in battle. With everyone's combined efforts, they managed to defeat androids 17 and 18. Goku says that it doesn't make sense, because if Piccolo never went to Namek in this world, he shouldn't have been able to defeat androids 17 and 18. He wouldn't have had increased his power by merging with Nail, so fusing with Kami alone wouldn't have been enough to match the androids. But Vegeta reminds Goku that in Trunks' future, androids 17 and 18 were much weaker than in their timeline. Perhaps that's also the case in this world, and maybe they are even weaker than the androids in Trunks' future. Because without Goku's existence in this world, things followed a different path. Dr. Gero created androids strong enough to defeat the Earthlings, not someone stronger like Goku. After hearing Vegeta's theory, Goku agrees. Goku mentions that in his world, Krillin married Android 18 and asks why it didn't happen in this world. Krillin disdainfully replies that he would never marry someone like her because she was too evil. Vegeta has a big question, which is how they dealt with Majin Buu since he was extremely powerful by the standards of that time, and his power was far beyond the reach of Piccolo or any Earthling. They explain that sometime before Majin Buu arrived, the Supreme Kai arrived on Earth and warned them about Babidi's plans, so they were taken to the Supreme Kai's planet to train. There, an ancient Kai Ocean was called upon to assist in their training. This elderly deity performed a ritual to unlock their hidden potential, making them incredibly more powerful. Among them, Piccolo became the strongest and even learned how to change his form. Goku says that this old Kaioshin was trapped inside the Z-Sword and asks if they also broke the sword like Gohan did. But they say that there was no Kaioshin trapped inside any sword. He was just living normally. Goku and Vegeta concluded that in this world, Beerus never sealed the old Kaioshin inside a sword. The others continue telling their story, mentioning that after the events involving Babidi, the Earth has been at peace for all these years. However, they never stop training because they never know when the next danger might arise. Goku and Vegeta ponders over this and concludes that it makes sense that nothing else happened on this planet. If the Saiyans weren't on Earth, Beerus, Frieza, and Moro wouldn't have gone there and Universe 7 wouldn't have been erased during the Tournament of Power either, because the tournament only happened because Goku brought the future's Zeno to their timeline, and it was from his conversation with the two Zenos that the idea of the tournament arose. Goku asks if two androids named Gamma 1 and 2 cause trouble on the planet, but they say no. At that moment, Vegeta realizes that these events haven't happened yet in this timeline, and maybe they never will. They were told that an android named Cell Max was created while they were away from Earth, but in this world, Cell never even came into existence. 
Despite all the explanations they received from the Earth Warriors, Goku and Vegeta are still very curious. They wonder what Frieza is up to and why Goku wasn't sent to that planet. Vegeta says that Goku was sent to Earth during the destruction of planet Vegeta. If he didn't arrive, it means he either died during the planet's destruction or the planet wasn't destroyed. They are eager to know what happened, so Vegeta suggests they go there. Since he knows the planet's location, Vegeta uses instant transmission to take them there. When the two visitors suddenly vanish from the table, everyone present is left speechless, as they left just as randomly as they arrived. A comedic, confusing, and awkward silence remains for everyone there. Goku and Vegeta teleport to the location of planet Vegeta, and to their surprise, the planet is still there. Vegeta smiles upon seeing his home planet and says he thought he would never see that place again in his life. Goku says he also never thought he would visit that place someday, and then asks Vegeta what might have happened for the planet to still exist in this world. Vegeta naturally concludes that Frieza didn't destroy the planet for some reason. Perhaps he doesn't exist in this world, or maybe someone defeated him in the past. He says to find the answer, they must meet their own versions in this world, or maybe his Father. But before they could do that, they noticed a group of people approaching at high speed. It's a group of Saiyan warriors. The group of soldiers reaches and surrounds them. They say their radars detected two sudden arrivals on the planet, and they came to investigate. Vegeta senses the key of the soldiers and is surprised to find that their power levels are much higher than the average power level of a Saiyan soldier in their world. He says each of these men is more powerful than he was when he attacked Earth, and at that time, he was already stronger than any Saiyan he knew before the destruction of planet Vegeta. He wonders why the Saiyans in this world are so strong. The Saiyan soldiers obviously notice their appearances and are perplexed by the resemblance of the two with King Vegeta and Kakarot. With their words, Goku and Vegeta realize that in this world, Vegeta is the king of the planet and Kakarot is apparently a well-known figure. But despite recognizing their faces, the soldiers are not friendly and say that they cannot be King Vegeta or Kakarot because both of them were in the king's castle. They were the ones who detected the invasion on the radar and ordered the invaders to be captured. In other words, these two standing before them can only be imposters. Vegeta is irritated by being called an imposter but tries to ignore it and asks to be taken to the king for a conversation. But the soldiers say he is not in a position to give orders and that they will only take them to the king after they have broken a few bones. Vegeta tells these worms to know their place and flicks the air, and with just the pressure from Vegeta's flick, one of the Saiyan soldiers is knocked out, leaving the others extremely impressed. The soldiers become angry, and realizing that these two individuals are strong, they say they will use their full power. After they declare that, much to Goku and Vegeta's complete shock, all the surrounding Saiyan soldiers transform into Super Saiyans. Goku and Vegeta are left completely dumbfounded, wondering how these ordinary soldiers can be Super Saiyans. One of the soldiers, impatient, decides to attack first. He flies towards Vegeta and throws a punch at his face. But to the soldier's dismay, his companion's shock, his hand breaks upon impact with Vegeta's body. Vegeta becomes very angry that this worm dared to touch him like that. As he releases his power, causing everyone around him to be blown away, he yells at them not to think too highly of themselves, just because they can transform into Super Saiyans. After being thrown away by Vegeta's mere energy release, the Saiyan soldiers are lying on the ground, surprised by the power this man is showing. But then they notice the arrival of someone else. Approaching from behind, Goku and Vegeta telling them to leave his men alone. As they turn to see who it is, they're shocked. It's Bardock, referred to by the soldiers simply as General. General Bardock tells his men not to worry and that he will take care of these two invaders, and so he transforms into Super Saiyan 2. This also surprises Goku and Vegeta, as Goku extends his hand out towards his father in a pacifying gesture. Bardock, the Saiyan general, unleashes a powerful wave of energy towards them. Despite Goku's peaceful gestures, Bardock fires a wave of power at him and Vegeta, both of whom dodge it. Seeing Goku's face, Bardock can't help but notice the resemblance between Goku and himself, as well as his son Kakarot. Bardock and the other Saiyans believe that Goku and Vegeta are impossible who somehow replicated the appearance of King Vegeta and Kakarot. So Bardock becomes very angry and vows to make Goku pay for using his son's face to defame his family. Bardock launches several key blasts at Goku, who comically dodges the attacks while trying to explain that he is actually his son, Kakarot from another reality. But Bardock obviously doesn't believe him and becomes even more angry. Bardock decides to stop the long-range attacks and goes for physical combat, attempting a sequence of punches at Goku, who dodges the attacks while pleading with his father to stop. With each missed attack, Bardock grows even angrier, shouting at his opponent to stop running like a coward. Goku complies with his father's request and decides not to dodge one of his punches. Instead, he gently deflects the attack with his arm and then uses Bardock's own force to manipulate him and throw him away. Bardock spirals in the air several times before coming to a stop. Even more furious, he unleashes a powerful wave of energy against Goku. Bardock doesn't see Goku dodge, so it 
appears that Goku was hit and engulfed by the attack. When the energy dissipates, Goku is no longer there. Bardock smiles thinking he has torn him to pieces, but the next moment he is surprised when Goku, standing right behind him, greets him with a hi. Bardock is shocked and backs away, asking how Goku got there. Goku says he simply moved there, but Bardock claims it's impossible for him to have moved so quickly. While this battle takes place in the sky of a desolate region of planet Vegeta, a drone flying above records everything. These images are being broadcasted in the royal castle where King Vegeta IV watches everything from his throne, with Kakarot standing by his side as a bodyguard. King Vegeta is highly impressed with what is happening and comments that even General Bardock, one of the most powerful warriors of the Saiyan army, is being treated like a fool by this imposter. Kakarot is also very surprised and asks Vegeta what they should do, and the king ponders. Back at the battle site, Bardock continues trying to hit Goku, who effortlessly evades his father's attacks. Bardock attempts both physical and energy attacks, but Goku easily dodges them all. Meanwhile, several Saiyan soldiers start flying closer. They seem to be coming from various regions of the planet. They gather around and watch in shock as General Bardock, one of the most powerful Saiyans on the planet, is being completely humiliated by this imposter. Feeling humiliated in front of his subordinates, Bardock attacks with even more ferocity, but it's all in vain. Vegeta becomes annoyed with the situation and tells Goku to finish the fight once and for all, as it's turning into a circus. Goku insists that he doesn't want to fight his own father, but Vegeta warns him to find a way to end it or he'll do it himself. Goku starts thinking for a moment and remembers when he faced Chi Chi in the 23rd Martial Arts Tournament many years ago and how he defeated her. After recalling that, Goku steps back and dodges one of Bardock's physical blows. Bardock creates an energy sphere and full of rage launches the attack at the imposter. Even though the attack contains all of his father's rage as a Super Saiyan 2, Goku remains calm. He takes a fighting stance, concentrates his power in one hand, and then makes a move in the air. The pressure from Goku's attacks creates a powerful shockwave that passes through Bardock's energy sphere, shattering it, and then goes straight towards Bardock, hitting the Saiyan general and sending him plummeting into the sky. The Saiyan soldiers watching Bardock's fall in complete shock can't believe what they just witnessed. When Bardock reaches the ground, he reverts to his base form but manages to stay conscious. He is in complete shock, wondering how what just happened could be possible. Goku is a little concerned, apologizing in case he went overboard with the attack. He swears he did his best not to hurt his father. The Saiyan soldiers around them, not believing what they saw, start theorizing that it must have been a trick. They are convinced that the imposter has some secret technique that made it seem like he defeated Bardock with ease. Convinced of their own theory, the Saiyan soldiers fill with courage and they all transform into Super Saiyans, heading towards Goku and Vegeta to protect their general. Goku comically panics, telling Vegeta that they are simply being attacked by an army of Super Saiyans. Vegeta asks why he's scared since they are no big deal for the two of them, even in their transformed state. Goku replies, that he's not exactly scared, but the situation is so bizarre that he can't help but be surprised. The first Super Saiyan attacks Vegeta with a punch, but just like the first one who tried, he ended up with a broken hand upon colliding with the prince's body. Vegeta retaliates by grabbing him by the face and throwing him into another approaching soldier. As more soldiers came to attack, Vegeta clapped his hands, creating a shockwave that repels the group of soldiers. Meanwhile, Goku is being attacked by a group of soldiers, but he effortlessly dodges all of their attacks. At one point, while evading two attacks simultaneously, he made the two soldiers hit themselves, and then he knocked out another one one just by dodging an attack, going behind him and tapping his neck. One of the soldiers concentrated all his power into an energy spear and then launched it at Goku. Seeing the attack coming, Goku pointed two fingers at the spear and then pointed two fingers in the direction where a group of soldiers was coming towards him. The first soldier's energy spear was teleported in front of the approaching group and exploded, pushing them all away. Meanwhile, another group of soldiers joined forces and formed a massive energy spear with the combined power of all of them. They launched the spear towards Vegeta, but despite the attack's massive power, he calmly waited for it to arrive. When the attack reached him, Vegeta stopped it with just one hand, and then with a Hakai, he made that massive power spear simply vanish. The Saiyan soldiers were in complete shock at the power of Goku and Vegeta, unable to believe that these two men were dealing with so many Super Saiyans at once and with such ease. But despite the shock, the soldiers continue bravely advancing. Bardock is watching everything from the ground, still injured from the attack he received, but now able to get up. He is very angry to see his soldiers being humiliated by those imposters. But at the same time, he wonders why these imposters are fighting 
wounding them without killing them, as it would apparently be very easy for them to do so. Bardock wants answers, but concludes that his Super Saiyan 2 power is nowhere near enough to deal with these guys, so he wonders if he should use the power he has kept secret for so long. However, at that moment he sees someone approaching from far on the horizon and gives up the idea. Goku and Vegeta continue to easily deal with the Saiyan soldiers when they sense a stronger key that catches their attention. At the same time, the soldiers see two people approaching at high speed. King Vegeta and Kakarot. As King Vegeta and Kakarot arrive, they stop to face the supposed imposters. Meanwhile, the soldiers enthusiastically greet their king, Vegeta IV, and his bodyguard, Kakarot. Goku and Vegeta are greatly surprised by this. They already knew that in this world, Vegeta was the king of the planet, but they never imagined that Kakarot would be his bodyguard. The Vegeta God of Destruction laughs and provocatively tells Goku that at least in this world, he acknowledges his superiority. Goku doesn't like it and asks his counterpart how he can be just a servant to Vegeta. Kakarot gets irritated and tells the supposed imposter to stop talking as if he knows him. King Vegeta, with a more serious and thoughtful demeanor, acknowledges the striking resemblance of these imposters to him and Kakarot, and also recognizes that they are undoubtedly very powerful. He tells Kakarot that they should not lower their guard and should start the fight using their full power. Kakarot likes the idea and shows it with a smile. He says he will enjoy it since he hasn't faced a worthy opponent since Vegeta himself. King Vegeta agrees, saying that it'll be good to fight seriously against someone other than themselves. At the same time, they both begin to concentrate a massive amount of power Power, and at that moment, the entire planet begins to tremble. The soldiers are completely ecstatic when this happens, and among them, it is said that they have been waiting for a long time to see this legendary transformation that has not been used in decades. Among these soldiers is one who looks much older than the others, and next to some younger soldiers, he proudly states that he has had the honor of witnessing this transformation being used years ago against the Universal Tyrant, and tells the younger one to keep their eyes wide open because they are about to witness something incredible. Goku and Vegeta also recognize this power, and they are very surprised by it. After a great concentration of energy, Kakarot and King Vegeta finally transform, and the transformation they are using is Super Saiyan 3. Goku and Vegeta are left speechless, especially by the fact that this reality's Vegeta can use Super Saiyan 3. Goku teases Vegeta saying that at least in this world he can use Super Saiyan 3, but Vegeta gets very annoyed and says that he has all the ability to learn Super Saiyan 3 if he wants to. He just doesn't think it's necessary. The Saiyans around them are highly impressed with the transformation of the king and his body Guard. They watch in awe as their long golden hair flows, as if looking at a treasure. King Vegeta and Kakarot are ready for the fight. King Vegeta says he's curious to see how strong his imposter is and tells Kakarot that he will deal with him. Kakarot likes the idea as he also wants to see how strong his imposter is and wants to teach him a lesson for humiliating his father. Vegeta God of Destruction is impatient and tells Goku that they have caused enough commotion and they are wasting time. But Goku is more excited than his companion and says that at least they will have a chance to fight against themselves. He provocatively asks if Vegeta isn't curious to see the power he would have as a Super Saiyan 3. Vegeta gets angry and says that he doesn't care about that outdated transformation. In a split second of distraction from Vegeta God of Destruction, King Vegeta appears in front of him, ready to punch him, but the Hakaishin immediately reacts to block the attack. Next, Kakarot advances against the old Goku with a series of attacks, but Goku evades them while retreating. The Saiyan soldiers watching are impressed by the swift movements of the king and his bodyguard, as they didn't even see them start to move. They conclude in wonder that the power of Super Saiyan 3 is truly incredible. But Bardock is not as happy as the others and watches everything attentively with a concerned expression. After having his attack blocked by the one he thinks is the imposter, King Vegeta raises his reflexes for reacting so quickly and also his strength for effortlessly blocking his blows in Super Saiyan 3. Vegeta, God of Destruction, says he hasn't seen anything yet and suggests that he give up the fight before getting hurt. King Vegeta gets angry and says that the proud king of the Saiyans never gives up a fight. King Vegeta starts unleashing more attacks, trying to land dozens of punches and kicks on the Hakaishin. But the God of Destruction easily dodges or blocks all the attacks. As he does this, he compliments his opponent saying he is truly strong, but is light years away from being a threat to him. King Vegeta gives up on physical attacks and resorts to energy attacks, moving away from the God of Destruction and firing dozens of key blasts at him. The key blasts explode upon hitting the Hakaishin, filling the sky with bursts of light. A few meters away, Kakarot and the old Goku also engage in their fight, with Kakarot attempting many physical attacks, all of which the older Goku effortlessly dodges. Kakarot is very frustrated and asks how he can do that and what kind of trick he's using. The old Goku responds that all he's doing is letting his body react to the attacks on its own. He explains that at this moment, he's not thinking about anything, and it's only his natural martial arts instincts that are dealing with the attacks. 
Hearing that Kakarot finds it ridiculous and thinks that Goku not thinking about anything means he's underestimating him. And then he says that Goku will pay for it. The Saiyan soldier lunges at the old Goku with a flying kick, but in a smooth and skillful move. Goku evades the attacker's leg with his arm, grabs him by his ankle, and then uses his own strength to spin him and throws him against a nearby rock. Kakarot storms out from among the rocks and launches several energy balls at Goku who easily dodges them while moving with agility and skill through the sky. After literally firing hundreds of ki blasts at the Vegeta God of Destruction, King Vegeta finally stops. He smiles and says that in the end, that guy wasn't all that impressive, despite his air of superiority. But King Vegeta's smile disappears when he sees that even after receiving all those multiple explosions head on, his opponent is standing in the same place, completely unharmed. King Vegeta is in shock, as are all the soldiers around who are watching. The Vegeta God of Destruction smiles and asks if that's all his Super Saiyan 3 version has got. The king goes into a fit of rage and starts releasing an immense amount of energy in a giant aura of power. Then he assumes a posture that the Vegeta God of Destruction knows all too well. The final flash stands. Seeing that posture surprises Vegeta God of Destruction, who is astonished that this version of him also knows that technique. After concentrating a massive amount of energy, King Vegeta sees the shock on his imposter's face and smiles, thinking his opponent is impressed and afraid of his power. He says that now his enemy finally knows his true power and is afraid, but there's no chance for remorse now, and he will be completely obliterated by this attack. The Saiyan soldiers around are completely ecstatic, with all the power being concentrated by the king. They are confident, completely convinced that this attack will obliterate their enemy. King Vegeta unleashes his final flash, a powerful energy wave that is at least 10 times the size of the one the real Vegeta launched against Cell. Seeing that massive wave of power coming towards him, Vegeta God of Destruction smiles, then extends one of his hands and says, Hakai. And in the next moment, all that massive power disappears in the form of tiny flakes of energy. King Vegeta is left paralyzed and dumbfounded, not even knowing how to react to the absurdity that just happened. Not only is he in shock, but also all the soldiers around who can't believe that all that massive power of their king vanished like that. After launching hundreds or thousands of key blasts at Goku, Kakarot finally stops panting. He's very frustrated since not even one of his attacks hit his opponent. The old Goku observes Kakarot and deduces that he must be tired by now, saying that unfortunately, Super Saiyan 3 does that. He explains that while this transformation allows them to concentrate a great amount of power, it also becomes a very tiring form to use. Kakarot asks what he knows about this transformation, and Goku responds by telling him that he has known how to use this transformation for decades. Kakarot doesn't believe what he's saying, but Goku says he can prove it. He starts concentrating his energy and then transforms into Super Saiyan 3. Seeing the supposed imposter transforming, Kakarot is very impressed and surprised, wondering how something like that can be possible. But Kakarot is not the only one shocked by Goku's transformation. King Vegeta and all the other Saiyan soldiers are also stunned. Kakarot asks how this can be possible, stating that the only mortal Saiyans who can transform into Super Saiyan 3 currently are him and King Vegeta, which is why they are considered the strongest men on this planet below God. When Kakarot mentions God, Goku's attention is drawn to it, and he asks if there is also someone on the planet who can transform into Super Saiyan God. Kakarot is surprised that Goku knows the term Super Saiyan God. After seeing Goku transform into Super Saiyan 3, King Vegeta asks Vegeta God of Destruction how that imposter can do such a thing. Vegeta responds by saying that that guy is a version from another reality of the Kakarot that King Vegeta knows. So there's nothing that Kakarot from this reality can do that Kakarot from his reality can. King Vegeta seems to start doubting whether he's telling the truth and says that if that's the case he wants to see him transform into Super Saiyan 3 too. That way he can believe what the imposter is saying. But Vegeta God of Destruction becomes comically embarrassed and annoyed by this, almost whispering that he doesn't transform into Super Saiyan 3. The king gets angry with that and says it's shameful that Kakarot's imposter can and transform into Super Saiyan 3 while his imposter can't. The God of Destruction gets furious and says there's nothing Kakarot can do that he doesn't have the ability to do, he just doesn't think it's necessary to transform into Super Saiyan 3. That's all. King Vegeta says he almost believed him, but now he sees that the one in front of him must be just an imposter. He starts concentrating more energy and this time assumes the Gallic Gun stance. Vegeta God of Destruction obviously recognizes the stance and sees an opportunity. When the king fires the Gallic Gun, the God of Destruction 
king quickly assumes the same posture and fires the technique as well, surprising the king. When the two Gallic guns clash, Vegeta God of Destruction's technique easily surpasses the king's. To the shock of all the Saiyan soldiers present, the king is hit by the energy and falls from the sky. As soon as he reaches the ground, King Vegeta lies there for a while and reverts to his base form. Kakarot flies over to him, and he is also back in his base form. King Vegeta asks why Kakarot is no longer transformed, and he says that maybe they should stop fighting and listen to what these men have to say, since they really don't seem to intend to harm them. Bardock arrives and agrees with this, saying that the guy who looks identical to his son really didn't seem to intend to hurt him. And as humiliating as it was, he fought the whole time, taking every possible care not to injure him. King Vegeta ponders, saying it's really hard to imagine that a mere imposter of his would know his Gallic gun, or that a mere imposter of Kakarot would know Super Saiyan 3. The old Goku and the Vegeta God of Destruction land nearby, and Goku is also no longer transformed into Super Saiyan 3. Goku says that now that they've met each other, they should stop fighting and talk a bit. Reluctantly, King Vegeta agrees. Sometime later, King Vegeta, Kakarot, and Bardock had taken Goku and Vegeta to the planet's royal castle. Observing the castle closely, Vegeta recognized it as almost the same one he lived in during his childhood. With very few changes, it was very nostalgic for him to be back in that place. On the other hand, Goku found the place very strange and gloomy, but obviously he didn't say that to the others. King Vegeta, Kakarot, and Bardock tended to their own wounds and changed their clothes. Then the king arranged a banquet for the visitors to eat while they talked about the situation. Just like they did on planet Earth, Goku and Vegeta explained everything that happened to them and that they are now in this alternate reality where the destruction of planet Vegeta, which was a key element in their lives, in their timeline, did not happen. So they want to understand why planet Vegeta wasn't destroyed by this reality and how the Saiyans in this world are so much more powerful than they were in their world. King Vegeta recounted that many years ago there was a war among the Saiyans, just as Vegeta, God of Destruction, had told him happened in their world. But the difference between their reality and the legend in Goku and Vegeta's world is that the Super Saiyan God Yamoshi did not die in that battle. Yamoshi survived the war against the evil Saiyans, and after the victory, he guided the Saiyan people and taught them how to become more powerful. King Vegeta explained that thanks to Yamoshi's training, despite no Saiyan could achieve divine transformations like him, at least they were able to attain the non-divine transformations of the race. Almost all Saiyan soldiers today is capable of transforming to a Super Saiyan as they have special training since childhood to achieve this form in adulthood. And any soldier who cannot transform into a Super Saiyan is treated as a joke. It is almost an obligation to achieve this form. On the other hand, Super Saiyan 2 is not something so simple. And in fact, only a minority of Saiyan warriors can achieve this form. Any Saiyan who can transform into Super Saiyan 2 is elevated to the highest positions in the army. This is the case for Bardock who is one of the main generals on the planet. As for Super Saiyan 3, this form is even rarer, and only those from the royal lineage can achieve this transformation, as is the case with Vegeta and his father before him, but not all members of the royal family can do it. This was the case with his brother Tarbal, who was sent to a distant location. Goku asks how his version in this world can transform into Super Saiyan 3 if only members of the royal family can do it. King Vegeta explains that this was an exception, and the reason Kakarot can do it is that since childhood they had a great rivalry, so they trained their whole lives to surpass each other and because of this rivalry, both were able to achieve this level of power. King Vegeta says this with shame, but admits that Kakarot was even able to reach this level before him. Goku is a little surprised that Kakarot would agree to be the bodyguard of his greatest rival, but Kakarot says that he only took on the job because it allows him to be very close to Vegeta almost all the time, making it easier for them to fight and train whenever they want. Vegeta, God of Destruction, asks about Frieza and whether they managed to kill him in this world. King Vegeta says they have a complicated history with Frieza. He recounts in the past, King Cold made an alliance with the Saiyans, but then he and his son Frieza tried to break that alliance and subjugate the Saiyans. In the war that occurred about 40 years ago, Cold's army was completely subjugated by the Saiyans, as Cold's regular soldiers were not able to face the Super Saiyans. Vegeta himself, who was just a child at the time, transformed into a Super Saiyan and managed to defeat Cold's most powerful squad alone, the Ginyu Special Forces. Meanwhile, General Bardock, who was considered the best Saiyan soldier, and King Vegeta III, his father, respectively faced King Cold and Frieza and managed to defeat them. King Cold was killed during the battle, however Frieza managed to escape, vowing revenge against all Saiyans. Sometime later, Frieza returned to planet Vegeta with a new transformation that had extraordinary power, something he called Golden Form. With this form that ridiculously increased his power, Frieza massacred hundreds of thousands of Saiyans. Even his father and Bardock couldn't defeat this tyrant. In this battle, Bardock was severely injured and King Vegeta III died. But for the first time in a long time, God descended from the sky. And using his divine transformations, he managed to defeat the Golden Demon 
and killed him once and for all. Goku and Vegeta are surprised by this and ask how Yamoshi can still be alive all this time. King Vegeta tells them that at some point, Yamoshi discovered about the Dragon Balls that existed on planet Namek. So he went there, gathered the orbs and asked the Dragon God to make him immortal. Vegeta, God of Destruction, also remembers that he wanted to wish for immortality to defeat Frieza. So he asks if there is a similar reason for Yamoshi wanting immortality. But before King Vegeta could respond to that, he seems to receive some kind of mental communication, which surprises him and also piques the curiosity of others present. After a few seconds of mental conversation with someone, King Vegeta finally speaks to the others again. And to everyone's surprise, he tells Goku and Vegeta, God of Destruction, that the God of the Saiyans, Yamoshi, wants to speak to them right away. Meanwhile, on Beerus' planet, the God of Destruction of Universe 7 is pressing Shin, ordering him to fix his planet as quickly as possible. Shin says he will do his best, but with all the damage that was caused there, it's easier for him to rebuild the planet than to fix it. Beerus says he doesn't care what the Kaioshin will do. He just wants everything to be exactly as it was before he returns. Shin sighs, thinking about the work it will take, and asks Beerus what he did to have left the planet in the state. But the Destroyer says that's none of his concern. After speaking with Shin, Beerus goes to Whis, who is a little further away, looking for something in his staff. As soon as he arrives next to the angel, he asks if Whis has found them. Whis says yes and tells them that the two of them are on planet Vegeta. Beerus becomes a little pensive and says it makes sense, since now that he thinks about it, those two really have an appearance that resembles the Saiyans. He smiles and recalls that it's been about a thousand years since he was on that planet, and as he says that, it seems like he has fond memories of the place. Beerus orders Whis to take him to planet Vegeta immediately. The angel asks if they shouldn't ask the Kaioshin to do that since he can take them there instantly. But Beerus says no and explains that he wants some time to think a little more about everything that happened and will do that on the way there. Besides, it's been so long since the last time that he wants to think about what he will say to that guy. Whis smiles and says it will be interesting to see this reunion. In a frozen region of planet Vegeta, there is a large mountain with its top above the clouds, and on this mountain there is a castle that is completely isolated from any civilization. On the top of this great castle, there is a large courtyard, and it is on the edge of this courtyard that a man stands looking down at the clouds below him. Flying to this place are the old Goku and Vegeta God of Destruction, who were brought by King Vegeta and Kakarot. When they arrive, the owner of the castle looks fixedly at them, while King Vegeta and Kakarot bows to greet the God of the Saiyans Yamoshi. Goku and Vegeta, God of destruction do not bow. They just stare fixedly at the living legend before them, barely believing that they are personally seeing a man who was only a distant legend to them until now. King Vegeta insists that they also kneel as a sign of respect to the legendary god of their race, but Yamoshi surprises them by saying that it is not necessary. And after that, the god of the Saiyans surprised them even more by saying that they should skip the formalities and go straight to what matters. Goku asks what he means by go straight to what matters, and Yamoshi asks them to fight him now. Goku and Vegeta, god of destruction, are surprised by this, and Kakarot and King Vegeta even more so. After Yamoshi asks Goku and Vegeta to fight him, everyone is surprised, especially King Vegeta and Kakarot, who ask for the reason behind this sudden request. Though surprised, Goku and Vegeta like the idea. They inquire with Yamoshi about whom he wants to fight, and the Saiyan God replies that he desires to fight both of them at once. However, he feels that he might not be capable of handling them both together, and thus leaves it to them to decide who will go first. Upon hearing Yamoshi say that he couldn't fight both of them at the same time, King Vegeta and Kakarot are astonished. They know that God should have enough power to defeat all the Saiyans on the planet single-handedly, so even though these outsiders are powerful, they assumed Yamoshi would deal with them easily. Meanwhile, in the underground dungeon, far below the upper courtyard of the castle, there is someone inside a capsule filled with a strange liquid. Who is this person and why is he there? Back in the courtyard, Goku and Vegeta now have to decide who will fight. Vegeta suggests the classic rock, paper, scissors, but Goku dislikes the idea and protests saying that Vegeta fought Beerus, so now it's his turn to fight. Vegeta argues that Goku fought Bardock, so they both had an individual fight, making them even. Goku counters that this comparison isn't fair, as Bardock doesn't compare to Beerus, and that wasn't even a real fight. But Vegeta responds by saying that a fight is a fight, no matter how easy it is. Being refuted, Goku has no choice but to agree to the game, but luckily for him, he wins. This leaves Vegeta frustrated as he wants wanted to face the first Super Saiyan God. Goku turns to Yamoshi to tell him he'll be his opponent, but Yamoshi is already right in front of him, charging at high speed with a prepared punch. Goku stops the strike with one finger and then dodges it, causing Yamoshi to crash straight into the castle wall, leaving a huge hole. King Vegeta and Kakarot are shocked because they didn't even see what happened. Goku scolds Yamoshi, calling his move cheating. The legendary Saiyan responds that in a fight, they must be prepared for anything, and once a battle is announced, you can't turn your back or lower your guard against your opponent. But Yamoshi is surprised that Goku reacted perfectly to his attack, despite appearing off guard. 
Goku explains that even when his mind isn't focused, his body can instinctively react. This ability is called Ultra Instinct. Then he compliments Yamoshi saying that even the base form punch he delivered was stronger than any attack from Bardock as a Super Saiyan 2 or Kakarot as a Super Saiyan 3. This means that even in his base form, Yamoshi is much stronger than other Saiyans in their most powerful forms. Yamoshi claims that it's obvious since he's known as the god of Saiyans for a reason. Yamoshi almost instantly without even needing to concentrate energy or anything like that, transforms into a Super Super Saiyan God, and then he lunges at Goku in a low-flying attempt to land one more punch. And this time, Goku dodges, going high. Yamoshi follows behind accompanying Goku's ascent into the sky as he tries several blows, but they are all avoided. While dodging the Super Saiyan God's attacks, Goku notes that Yamoshi in Super Saiyan God is much more powerful than he was when Beerus appeared. Yamoshi is surprised and asks what Goku means by that. Goku explains that in his world, he transformed into a Super Saiyan God to fight Beerus, the God of Destruction. He also reveals that as far as he knows, he he was the first Saiyan to become a Super Saiyan God after Yamoshi himself. In his world, Yamoshi is a legend and he was the first ever Super Saiyan God, but he is now deceased. Based on this legend, Beerus the God of Destruction came to his planet and Goku had to transform into a Super Saiyan God to fight him. After sharing this information, Goku grabs one of Yamoshi's punches and uses the Saiyan God's own force to hurl him back towards the courtyard. However, Yamoshi manages to recover before hitting the ground and lands safely. After pushing back his opponent, Goku decides to prove his words and transforms into Super Saiyan God. Seeing this, Yamoshi is very surprised, while King Vegeta and Kakarot are completely shocked. They never imagined that someone other than a god could use this divine transformation. Even surprised, Yamoshi smiles excitedly and asks if that's the only divine transformation Goku knows. Goku replies that it's not the only one and reveals he can also transform into Super Saiyan God Super Saiyan, which he simplifies as Super Saiyan Blue. He adds that Vegeta can do it too. When King Vegeta and Kakarot hear that Vegeta can also transform into Super Saiyan God and Blue, they look at him in awe. Vegeta with a proud smile asks his counterpart if he's still bragging just because he can turn into a Super Saiyan 3. After showing Yamoshi his Super Saiyan God form, Goku reverts to his base form, which surprises the Super Saiyan God. Yamoshi asks if he won't keep the transformation. Goku replies no, saying that he has a much more powerful form than this one and he doesn't need to use it anymore. Also, he has reached such a high level of control of his energy that he no longer needs to transform his body to obtain the power of his transformations. There is actually an exception to this, which is his ultimate form, but he only shows his ultimate transformation to really worthy opponents. Yamoshi is a little annoyed by this statement, but then he smiles and says that he will accept the challenge of making Goku show his final form. The Saiyan God decides to go to the next level and transforms into Super Saiyan God Super Saiyan. He tells Goku that he coincidentally also decided to call this form Super Saiyan Blue just to make it easier. And the two laugh at that, realizing they think alike. Seeing their God transform into Super Saiyan God Super Saiyan, Kakarot and King Vegeta are astounded. They comment that it was an honor just to see Yamoshi use Super Saiyan God. So witnessing Super Saiyan God Super Saiyan at that moment was unimaginable to them. They recall that they only saw this blue form once when Golden Frieza attacked. However, at that time, they could only catch a glimpse of the blue glow of that form because the fight was extremely fast and intense, and it ended quickly. They never imagined they would see that transformation again, especially in such clear detail. Yamoshi attacks Goku, this time in Super Saiyan Blue. He reaches the foreign Saiyan in the sky with a series of attacks, whose increase in power and speed is noticeable to Goku, who praises Yamoshi for it. However, Goku continues to dodge the attacks quite easily. Yamoshi recalls what Goku said earlier about Beerus going to his planet because of the Super Saiyan God legend and asks what happened afterwards. Goku explains that at the time, even after transforming into Super Saiyan God and increasing his power significantly, he still couldn't come close to defeating Beerus and was defeated. However, Beerus spared his planet. Then he and Vegeta were trained by Beerus' master, Whis. That's how they learned Super Saiyan Blue and other things. Goku says that, in a way, Beerus and Whis ended up becoming their mentors. Yamoshi is surprised by this revelation and asks if Beerus would really become someone's mentor. Goku is taken aback that Yamoshi knows Beerus, and using this moment of surprise, Yamoshi suddenly increases the power of his Super Saiyan Blue. The blue aura suddenly grows, surrounded by electricity surprising Goku. With this sudden surge in power, Yamoshi's movements become extremely faster, and unprepared for it, Goku can't dodge the attack and can only block it with his arms. The blow sends him flying, and Goku descends from 
from the sky toward the top of a large mountain, where he lands while performing some acrobatics to cushion the fall. Goku is very surprised, saying that what he sees looks a lot like Super Saiyan 2. As Yamoshi also lands on the mountaintop, he confirms Goku's suspicion, saying that it is indeed Super Saiyan Blue 2. Over time, Yamoshi realizes that the logic of the Divine Saiyan forms wasn't so different from that of the non-divine forms. The only major difference was that just one type of transformation used regular key, and the other used divine key. He learned that just as he could surpass the power of regular Super Saiyan with Super Saiyan 2, he could also surpass the power of regular Super Saiyan Blue with Super Saiyan Blue 2. Yamoshi interrupts his explanation to suddenly attack Goku who blocks the attack head on. After that, Yamoshi does an acrobatic leap, going above Goku and unleashing a powerful point-blank energy wave that's strong enough to engulf the entire mountain. But Goku manages to dodge the attack and goes behind him. When Yamoshi turns around, he's caught off guard by Goku's first attack in the fight, a direct punch to the abdomen that is strong enough to completely shake the Saiyan God, causing him to step back with his hand over his abdomen while coughing up blood. Despite the pain, Yamoshi smiles and says that he finally feels that Goku is starting to take him seriously. Goku says that he is indeed very strong with Super Saiyan Blue too, but if Yamoshi wants to make him fight for real, he has to do better than that. Yamoshi says that if that's the case, he will do better. He starts concentrating his power, and he emits an energy so powerful that it makes the entire planet tremble, causing the mountains around them to collapse. In no time, Goku was witnessing something he never imagined he would see. The Super Saiyan Blue 3. At a certain distance, King Vegeta, Kakarot, and Vegeta, God of Destruction, observe they had to leave the castle as well to continue watching the fight. Vegeta, God of Destruction, is surprised to see a Super Saiyan Blue 3, but upon further thought, he concludes that it makes sense. He observes that apparently Yamoshi, unlike him and Goku, who focuses their efforts on other techniques and transformations, decided to enhance the divine forms of the Super Saiyan. While he and Goku stopped at perfected Super Saiyan Blue 1, Yamoshi went far beyond and achieved Phase 2 and even Phase 3 of this form. And that's not all. Vegeta wouldn't doubt if he had even more secrets. Besides this, King Vegeta and Kakarot are completely shocked, not even believing what they're seeing. They already thought it was a miracle to see regular Super Saiyan Blue, so witnessing this form now feels like a lifelong achievement to them. Even Goku is impressed by the form before him, and he says that after seeing Super Saiyan Blue 2, it was to be expected that a Phase 3 would be possible. He admits he never imagined seeing a transformation like this, so he's very curious to see the power of this form. Yamoshi says that if that's the case, he'll satisfy his curiosity. The Saiyan God starts firing various energy attacks at Goku, who agilely dodges the explosive attacks as he launches himself forward with a powerful punch. However, Yamoshi skillfully defends himself, blocking the attack with his forearm, creating a shockwave that pushes both of them backward, launching them from the sky to the ground. But they manage to land safely. Goku is the first to react, heading towards Yamoshi to attack. But Yamoshi tries to stop his advance by launching a key wave at him. Goku responds by raising his own key, creating a defensive barrier, and thanks to it, he advances through Yamoshi's energy. Seeing Goku approach ready to land a punch, Yamoshi must act immediately and responds with another punch. Their blows collide with such force that they create an explosion of power, shaking the ground and propelling them into the air. As they float in the air, they continue to exchange blows, each demonstrating great mastery in martial arts. While they fight, Goku asks how Yamoshi knows Beerus, and Yamoshi tells him that a, a thousand years ago, the god of destruction named Beerus came to the Saiyan planet looking for the Super Saiyan God, saying he had a prophetic dream that this warrior would provide him with a good fight. At that time, Yamoshi had not long since transformed into Super Saiyan God and couldn't even transform into Super Saiyan Blue. Thus, he was no match for the God of Destruction. Despite easily winning the fight, Beerus acknowledged Yamoshi's potential and said he could give him a good fight in the future. So Beerus made a deal. He wouldn't kill Yamoshi or destroy the Saiyans, but Yamoshi had to become more powerful. And in a few centuries or millennia, he would return to face him. If Yamoshi couldn't defeat him, Beerus would destroy all the Saiyans. Yamoshi says that to live for so long, he went to Namek and asked the Dragon God for immortality, and during all that time, he has been training, waiting for the God of Destruction's return. However, despite more than a thousand years passing, Beerus never came back. Now the fight reaches an even more intense level. Goku and Yamoshi exchange blows at an astonishing speed, each move accompanied by bursts of energy that illuminate the scene and cause multiple explosions. The ground trembles under the impact of their attacks, and the mountains around them begin to crumble in the midst of destruction. While they trade intense blows, Yamoshi says that for all these years he has been training to fight the God of Destruction, who promised to come and destroy his people. Despite evolving a lot during this time, he feels he could have evolved
evolved much more if he had someone like Goku to train with. Goku responds that if he had a mentor like Yamoshi, he too could have become much stronger, much faster. Goku performs a series of rapid movements, disappearing from Yamoshi's sight for a moment. Then he reappears behind his opponent, delivering a series of powerful punches that hit Yamoshi and stun him. But Yamoshi quickly reacts by generating a force of impact with his power, pushing Goku away. And he is pushed away. Goku says that the fight has been very fun, but it's time to end it. He concentrates his energy in his hands and unleashes a powerful Kamehameha towards Yamoshi. The ancient warrior responds with a pride lightning, a beam of yellow energy charged with intense electricity. The attacks collide in mid-air, creating an even larger explosion than before. The shock of the opposing forces pushes them back, and they have to fight against the pressure to maintain control. The shock waves of that tremendous impact reverberate throughout the environment, and even the powerful Saiyan God's castle begins to tremble. Even the underground area is affected, including the prison capsule that holds the mysterious person. When the impact waves reach the capsule, the glass cracks, and the liquid inside starts to leak slowly. In a matter of seconds, the eyes of the mysterious person begin to move discreetly. As he measures his power against Goku's, Yamoshi drastically increases the level of his ki, emanating a huge aura full of lightning around his Super Saiyan Blue 3 form. But when Goku elevates his power further, there's no chance for the legendary warrior and his power is completely overwhelmed. Goku's blue energy completely engulfs Yamoshi's yellow energy and it reaches the Saiyan God, who after receiving that massive amount of power, falls from the sky to the ground. Now in his base form, extremely wounded but still conscious. Goku lands near him asking if he's okay. Yamoshi says yes and then transforms into Super Saiyan God and begins to heal his wounds, which surprises Goku a bit, as he seems to have nearly perfect control over this ability. It only takes a minute for Yamoshi to be completely healed and stand back up in his base form. Goku is surprised by the effectiveness of this ability and asks if he can heal himself whenever he wants. Yamoshi says yes, but it's not unlimited, as it requires energy, though not too much. Yamoshi accepts his defeat with resignation, saying, it's a bit embarrassing to be defeated in front of those who consider him to be an unbeatable god. God, but at least he was defeated by a worthy opponent. It doesn't take long for Kakarot and Vegeta to approach. Kakarot and King Vegeta can hardly believe that their god was defeated in this manner. But the god of destruction Vegeta is not as surprised by Goku's victory, although he is impressed by Yamoshi's remarkable abilities. Yamoshi says that after talking to Goku, he started to understand the situation better. He explains that when he felt the power of Goku and Vegeta, he became very curious about them. When he saw Vegeta wearing the same outfit as Beerus, his curiosity grew even more. He wanted to fight them to see if they were bad people and also wanted to witness their full power. Unfortunately, it seems he wasn't strong enough to make Goku use his full power. In fact, Yamoshi believes that Goku didn't even use nearly all of his power. Obviously, King Vegeta and Kakarot are shocked to hear their gods say this, and now they realize they never stood a chance against them. Anyway, after fighting Goku, Yamoshi was able to sense his spirit and knows that he is not a threat to their planet, nor his companion. He invites the visitors to his castle to have a better conversation and understand the situation in more detail. However, in the castle, underground, the prison capsule is already empty. At that moment, the eyes of the person who was inside the capsule opens. Outside, Goku and Vegeta feel something that completely surprises them, and at first, the others don't understand. But in the next second, an energy pillar completely engulfs Yamoshi's castle, along with the giant mountain on which the structure stood. Sensing that power, the Saiyan God now comprehends what is happening and is filled with dread. Goku asks Vegeta if he also recognizes this energy, and Vegeta says that although it's slightly different and more malevolent, he recognizes the owner of that power. From the midst of that great energy pillar emerges Brawly with his muscles tearing his skin, his long green hair fluttering under the pressure of his power, and his pupils vanished. Goku and Vegeta are very surprised to see Brawly there, especially because this Brawly seems a bit different from what they know. In space, Beerus and Whis are in the middle of their journey to planet Vegeta. Beerus comments to Whis that things seem to have heated up a bit on the Saiyan planet. He says this because he felt the key emitted by Goku and Yamoshi during their battle, but Beerus notices that their key has finally decreased meaning the fight is over. Whis remarks that it seems Yamoshi made good use of those thousand years and has become extremely powerful than he was. Beerus agrees but says that if Yamoshi really used all that power he had just now, unfortunately, it's nowhere near enough to defeat him. Whis asks if he intends to have his revenge against the god of the Saiyans today, but Beerus says no, as he is interested in the other two. Suddenly, their conversation is interrupted when they sense an immense power. Beerus is astonished wondering if this power comes from planet Vegeta and who it belongs to. Whis says that this key certainly doesn't belong to Yamoshi or the other two. 
Beerus is very eager to know what's happening and tells Whis to accelerate. After revealing his presence, Brawly creates a gigantic sphere of power and launches it towards them, a devastating attack with enough power to destroy the entire planet. Yamoshi, Kakarot, and King Vegeta react immediately, with Yamoshi transforming into Super Saiyan Blue and the other two transforming into Super Saiyan 3. They all launch an energy attack against the power sphere launched by Brawly. When the energy from the three clashes with the energy of the legendary Super Saiyan, a massive explosion occurs in the sky. They immediately realize that even though it didn't hit the planet, it would still destroy it. God Vegeta quickly uses his power to create an energy shield to contain the explosion. While the explosion is contained by Vegeta's shield, Goku who is beside him points his hand and teleports the spear away, stating that he sent it to the region of the universe where there were no living beings. Yamoshi thanks the two of them as they've just saved the planet. King Vegeta becomes furious at almost having his planet destroyed and charges towards Brawly with bloodlust. He is immediately followed by Kakarot who doesn't want to let him face this monster alone. Yamoshi tries to tell him not to go, but it's too late. King Vegeta reaches Brawly delivering a punch with all his strength to his face, but he is completely shocked when he hurts his hand instead of Brawly's face. Brawly smirks and says that it looks like only his hair grew, not his power. He retaliates by slapping Vegeta across the face, sending him flying into Kakarot who was right behind him. After Kakarot catches Vegeta, the king feels humiliated and furious. He attacks again, this time with an energy attack, which Kakarot compliments by releasing his own power too. The combined energies form a massive wave of power that completely engulfs Brawly's body. However, the larger Saiyan remains in the same spot, as if the attack had no effect. Afterwards, he advances against the two, grabbing each of them by the throat, with one hand and carrying them from the sky to the ground, burying them into the rock while strangling them. While the king and his bodyguard struggle, suffocating in his grip, Brawly laughs, saying he will crush their necks just like one crushes a cockroach. But then he releases them at the same time. Yamoshi arrives, delivering a flying kick to his face that sends him backward. After being pushed back by Yamoshi's kick in the Super Saiyan Blue, Brawly notices blood dripping from his nose, but he licks his own blood while cynically praising your divinity for the kick. Yamoshi says there's much more where that came from and suggests that Brawly stops and accepts being imprisoned again. Brawly says that will never happen, and he lunges as fast as a bullet in a low flight towards the Saiyan God in attempt to strike. Just as Yamoshi evades from below and counters by landing an upward strike that sends Brawly soaring into the air. After launching Brawly into the air, Yamoshi points his hands towards him and unleashes a powerful wave of power, which generates a mighty explosion upon hitting Brawly. After enduring this attack, the legendary Super Saiyan displays some wounds, but far fewer than Yamoshi expected. With a sadistic grin, Brawly seems to relish the pain and the challenge. He wipes the blood that dripped from his mouth with the back of his hand, locking eyes with Yamoshi intensely. His eyes glow in fierce green as he unleashes his power even more intensely, causing the green Super Saiyan aura to envelop him like a turbulent storm. Yamoshi readies himself for the next assault, fully aware that his adversary is not to be underestimated. Kakarot and King Vegeta are still recovering from the brief yet powerful strangulation they suffered from brawling. They have reverted to their base forms since they realize that not even as Super Saiyan 3s could they pose any challenge to the enemy. Goku and Vegeta approach their defeated counterparts, extremely curious about the story behind this Brawly who is clearly very different from their reality's version. King Vegeta explains that decades ago, a Saiyan baby was born with an extremely high latent power. The latent power of the child was so high that it surpassed even King Vegeta III's base power, his father's. Naturally, the birth of a Saiyan with such power greatly concerned the king, as it was something completely abnormal. King Vegeta wanted to send this baby to an unknown planet to die there, but a god came to his castle and said he wanted to take the child. While this conversation unfolds, the battle between Yamoshi and Brawly continues, leaving evidence in the form of multiple images impact waves spreading across the sky and tremors reverberating throughout the planet due to the intense exchange of extremely fast and powerful blows. At one moment they are exchanging blows close to the ground when suddenly Brawly disappears from Yamoshi's sight in the blink of an eye, reappearing in the distance with incredible speed. His figure dissolves into a green blur as he zooms with incredible speed in a low flight like an unstoppable force of nature. Yamoshi reacts swiftly moving aside and narrowly avoiding Brawly's devastating strike which passes him like a true flying bull, leaving a massive trail of destruction on the ground due to the impact of his low flight. Brawly skids across the ground, slowing his speed as he readies for another attack. His tense muscles reveal his readiness to strike again. Yamoshi is also prepared, his brilliant blue aura pulsing with power. The two launch themselves at each other, blow after blow, creating energy waves that traverse the battlefield like lightning. Each clash of their fists and feet is accompanied by deafening booms. Yamoshi employs agility and technique, dodging Brawly's brutal assaults and countering with surgical precision. But Brawly is not just brute strength, he embodies wildness in his fight, making every move unpredictable. After an intense exchange of blows, Yamoshi finds an 
opening, he spins in the air and delivers a powerful kick to Brawly's chest, sending him flying backward. Brawly crashes heavily to the ground, a cloud of dust rising around him. Yet he quickly recovers, rising with an almost maniacal laugh. Watching this battle, Goku and Vegeta realize that Brawly's power is rapidly escalating, and if this continues, Yamoshi will be defeated. Kakarot and King Vegeta are greatly surprised by this. They say they knew of Brawly's existence, as Bardock and King Vegeta III told them the story of the baby with extraordinary power, but they never imagined the child's power was this high. Yamoshi maintains his posture, vigilant and focused, while Brawly gazes at him with his green aura intensifying even further, enveloping him like a voracious flame. Emitting a powerful roar, Brawly charges once again, his speed and power pushed to new heights. Instead of moving, Yamoshi waits for the approaching adversary with a calm demeanor. Then when Brawly is close enough, he joins his hands and then separates them, releasing a layer of power that simply paralyzes the legendary Saiyan. Witnessing this, Goku is greatly surprised, as coincidentally, he used a very similar ability against Brawly in their fight on Earth. With Brawly immobilized by his technique, Yamoshi states that it's better to end this before things become too problematic. He moves to the back of Brawly, preparing an attack that would hit the legendary Saiyan's neck, an attack that according to Yamoshi would calm his ki and put him to sleep. But then his hand is grabbed. To the shock of the Saiyan god, Brawly moved and caught his hand. Yamoshi asks how he did that and with a sneering smile, Brawly informs the elder Saiyan that all he needed to do was to increase his power. Just that. With a grip, Brawly crushes Yamoshi's hand and then pierces through his abdomen and back with his arm. As Brawly withdraws his arm from his body, Yamoshi falls to his knees, reverting from his transformation. Raising his arm for a final blow, on the kneeling Saiyan, Brawly comments that it's simply ridiculous to see the one who proclaims himself a god like this. But before the deadly strike reaches Yamoshi, a flying kick hits Brawly's face, sending him flying far away until he collides with a boulder. The author of this attack is God Vegeta, who informs Yamoshi that from now on, he'll take over this fight. Old Goku tries to object, but Vegeta argues that he faced Yamoshi, so obviously it's his turn now. Faced with this argument, Goku has no response. Vegeta steps forward a bit, getting closer to Brawly and distancing himself from the others. Meanwhile, Goku, Kakarot, and King Vegeta go to check on Yamoshi, but he's already transformed into Super Saiyan God and healing his wound. He reassures the others, saying that he'll be fine shortly, though there's no cure for his pride. It's indeed pathetic for the one who proclaims himself a god of the Saiyans to suffer two humiliating defeats in the same day. But Goku comforts Yamoshi, saying that Brawly is a complicated case, and he and Vegeta also suffered a lot because of him in their reality. Although this Brawly seems to be much worse than the one they know. After recovering from Vegeta's attack, Brawly rubs his own face, sore where the kick landed. He comments that this attack was truly strong, much stronger than the attacks Yamoshi and those two weaklings were unleashing. Vegeta smiles proudly and tells him that he's on a whole different level, so Brawly better give up, or else he won't have any mercy and will destroy him utterly. Brawly laughs and says it will be very interesting to see him try. Brawly charges with a powerful strike. With his fist covered in a destructive green aura, Vegeta skillfully dodges and responds with a quick and precise punch to Brawly's stomach, making him recoil. Before Brawly can react, Vegeta fires an energy beam in his direction, hitting him squarely and creating a burst of light. The dust clears, revealing Brawly emerging from the attack with a determined look. He charges again, launching a sequence of furious punches and kicks, but Vegeta evades each blow with supernatural agility and nearly imperceptible movements. He quickly counterattacks, delivering a spinning kick that hits Brawly's chest, causing him to stagger backwards. Now that Yamoshi is healed, Goku asks him why he brought Brawly to his castle and how he became the psychopath. Yamoshi finishes telling the story that King Vegeta had started before, explaining that when Brawly was born, his power was so impressive that he could sense it even from his castle, so he began to keep an eye on him. Yamoshi confirms King Vegeta's story, saying that the predecessor king wanted to get rid of this child by sending him to a distant planet, but he intervened and requested to bring the boy to his castle and train him, as a Saiyan with such potential, if properly trained, could even surpass him, perhaps aid in the battle against Beerus when the destroyer returned. The Saiyan god brought Brawly and his father, Paragus, to the castle. His intention was to train the boy and teach him to control his power, while his father educated him as a father should. Yamoshi explains that for a few years, Years, things seem to be going well, and Brawly appeared to be a sweet, calm child, albeit very quiet. But at some point in adolescence, he simply went mad and revealed his sadistic and terrible side. Yamoshi recounts that Brawly brutally eliminated his own father and then attacked him, but he managed to immobilize and control him, and after that, he needed to imprison him. Brawly gathers his power and releases a powerful green energy beam from his hands. Vegeta counters the attack with just one of his hands, as if it's extremely easy for him. Vegeta launches himself towards Brawly at high speed, causing tension in the Mad Saiyan, who fires multiple energy attacks at the God of Destruction. But Vegeta is too fast. 
He skillfully dodges the shots and delivers a powerful knee strike that sends Brawly flying backward. Brawly recovers in the air, although he remains dazed. Completely furious, he focuses his energy in his hands, creating a massive green energy sphere. He hurls it towards Vegeta, who simply raises his hand and catches the energy. Then Vegeta hurls that energy back at Brawly. The attack hits Brawly head-on, causing an explosion that illuminates the entire battlefield. Brawly emerges from the smoke with difficulty, his green aura gradually weakening as he breathes heavily. Landing near Brawly, Vegeta remarks that it seems like all his bravado and ferocity are fading, so it's time to finish this fight. Vegeta advances against Brawly, preparing for the final attack, but with an extreme mixture of fear and rage, Brawly releases a massive amount of power. This power radiates in the form of a colossal energy pillar, its height even surpassing the planet's sky and visible from space. Brawly's energy is so intense that it pushes Vegeta away while obliterating the entire surrounding environment. Kakarot and King Vegeta are utterly shocked by the immense amount of power. Brawly just unleashed, especially considering that mere seconds ago he appeared exhausted and almost defeated. But Yamoshi isn't as surprised and explains that as far as he knows, Brawly's power potential is infinite. In other words, Brawly won't stop evolving as long as there's something for him to kill or destroy. The legendary Super Saiyan now emits an even more intense aura of energy as he stares at Vegeta with a sarcastic smile and asks if he looks fierce again. Despite the incredible power emanating from his opponent, Vegeta smiles and says it would be disappointing if Brawly were defeated so quickly. Brawly says he'll make Vegeta regret thinking that way and charges at him with astonishing speed. As Brawly charges with impressive speed and his power in a frenzied state, Vegeta remains calm and focused. He sidesteps Brawly's initial attack which whizzes through the air creating a gust that extends extends far beyond Vegeta. The God of Destruction seizes the opportunity and spins in the air, striking Brawly with a powerful sideways kick that pushes him aside. But he quickly recovers by launching a punch toward Vegeta, who narrowly avoids it and counters with an upward kick to Brawly's chin. Despite being dazed, the legendary Saiyan retaliates with a series of furious strikes. But despite the tremendous power behind the blows, Vegeta handles them like a master, dealing with an amateur's punches. After numerous dodges, Vegeta counterattacks with a sequence of rapid and precise punches that strike Brawly Brawly's body by forcing him to stagger back dazed. Brawly reacts in a furious motion, clapping his hands together forcefully, unleashing a shockwave that sends Vegeta flying backward. Seizing the split second in which the enemy recoils, Brawly lunges with a powerful punch, but Vegeta blocks it with his palm, absorbing the impact's force. After halting Brawly's punch, Vegeta grabs his hand and taking advantage of the proximity, extends his other hand towards the larger man and fires a point-blank energy wave that sears Brawly, leaving him even more dazed. But Brawly still doesn't yield and tries to counterattack Vegeta with a strike, yet the God of Destruction from another reality sidesteps, and while hovering and pointing his hands towards the grounded adversary, unleashes a barrage of energy attacks that surround Brawly from all sides, triggering a series of explosions. The impact and sounds of the seemingly endless explosions drive Brawly mad, causing him to release his power in a way that generates a massive impact explosion, dispersing Vegeta's attacks in a whirlwind of force. Goku, Yamoshi, Kakarot, and King Vegeta watch the battle intently, noticing that the more the fight progresses, the more powerful Brawly is becoming. Yamoshi criticizes Vegeta's decision in this fight and tells Goku that if Vegeta can end the battle, he should do so now while his power is still superior to Brawly's. He also criticizes Goku saying that he should go help Vegeta to finish this quickly. But Goku reassures him saying that even though Brawly is evolving rapidly, he is still far behind Vegeta. This is because Vegeta, like him, is at a level that goes beyond Brawly's or anyone else's comprehension. Goku says that Vegeta's level goes far beyond mere brute power. Vegeta has attained a higher understanding of himself and the meaning of power. He has achieved the Shinken. The three Saiyans are curious about this word and ask what this thing is called, the Shinken. But before Goku could explain, he senses a power attack coming toward them and instantly teleports himself and the others away, allowing the attack to hit only the ground and destroy the surroundings. Shortly afterward, they reappear in another nearby location, and Goku comments that Brawly seems to be resorting to increasingly desperate attacks. Brawly extends his hands towards Vegeta, intending to unleash a powerful energy attack, but Vegeta prevents it by moving toward him at a speed he didn't expect, and then grabs his fist, swiftly twirls and slams Brawly onto the ground with astonishing force. Before Brawly can recover, Vegeta appears above him and descends with a devastating kick, burying him even deeper into the ground. For a moment, the two disappear from everyone's view within the planet's surface, and all that can be seen or felt of their battle are the intense tremors generated with each impact, tremors which are accompanied by Brawly's loud groans, indicating he's the one receiving those blows. A few seconds later, they reappear with Brawly forcefully pulled from beneath the surface and propelled towards the sky. 
undoubtedly due to a powerful attack from Vegeta. After ascending for many meters due to the force of the impact, Brawly finally halts, vomiting a significant amount of blood and displaying great pain and fatigue. Soon after, Vegeta emerges from the ground as well, floating calmly and then landing. Brawly is utterly frustrated and asks how the hell he can be so strong. Vegeta merely replies that no matter how much Brawly evolves, he won't defeat him because for Brawly, it all comes down to raw power, and that alone isn't enough to overcome someone who has attained mastery and superior knowledge of power. For Brawly, none of those words make sense and in fact only serve to enrage him further. The legendary Super Saiyan becomes consumed with fury and creates a massive energy sphere, hurling it towards Vegeta, intending to destroy both him and the entire universe in a suicide suicidal attack. Despite seeing the universe destroying attack hurling towards him, Vegeta remains calm, very calm. Vegeta waits for the attack's arrival and then when Brawly's power is close enough, he extends just one hand and grabs it and shouts, Hakai. And in the next moment, the massive destructive energy mass simply vanishes. This shocks everyone, especially Brawly, who never imagined that attack could be repelled. Yamoshi, King Vegeta, and Kakarot are in complete shock, while the old Goku beside them is not surprised in the least. Curiously, Goku asks Yamoshi why he kept Brawly imprisoned all this time instead of simply killing him. After all, living in prison must have been as good as death, or worse for Brawly. Yet keeping him alive posed a risk to the planet and the Saiyan people. Yamoshi explains that at first he thought about it, but he considered that even though Brawly might be a danger, his power could be useful if the God of Destruction ever returned. He explains that his idea was to face Beerus with his own power when he arrived. However, since he didn't witness the full extent of the Destroyer's power the first time they fought, he couldn't know the Hakaishin's maximum capacity, leaving him uncertain about whether he could win or not. Because of that, Yamoshi decided to keep Brawly as a hidden card. If when Beerus returned, he could defeat him, he could unleash this beast against the Hakaishin. But suddenly a voice emerges behind them, saying, hello. A voice that when Yamoshi hears it, makes his bones vibrate and his heart stop for a moment. It's Beerus the Destroyer, who is accompanied by the Angel Wiss. Once his presence is noticed, Beerus greets the god of the Saiyans, whose face hasn't changed much after a thousand years according to him. Yamoshi is utterly shocked to see that being before him again. Understanding who that person is, King Vegeta and Kakarot become terrified. Goku isn't as surprised since, according to him, he has already sensed Beerus' presence some time ago, even before he arrived on the planet. Someone else who noticed Beerus' presence before was Vegeta. Vegeta, who ignores Brawly while looking at the Hakaishin, who has just arrived and says he was waiting for him. Only now does Brawly notice those who have just arrived and asks who they are. After revealing his presence, Beerus, who overheard Yamoshi's conversation with Goku, King Vegeta, and Kakarot, says he didn't expect the proud god of the Saiyans to resort to such a low tactic as imprisoning a madman to fight in his place. But he says it was at least a good plan since the Saiyan's potential is truly incredible and could become a danger to him if he learned to control his powers. However, Beerus asserts that in his current state, Brawly can't defeat him, and if he tried, he would be obliterated like trash. Brawly hears these words and becomes utterly furious. He tells Vegeta he'll kill kill him later, and then charges furiously at Beerus, emitting a significant amount of energy and forcing his power into one of his fists. But when the punch comes, Beerus stops it with just one hand, completely surprising Brawly. Afterward, he points his other hand at the Saiyan and says that people like him need to be swiftly eliminated before they become a bigger problem. Beerus says, Hakai, and then Brawly begins to disappear, in less than a second, becoming nothing more than dust. Yamoshi, Kakarot, and King Vegeta are utterly shocked, desperate to see the ease with which their enemy dealt with a man who until then had been far beyond their limits. Goku complains to Beerus saying he didn't need to destroy Brawly, but God Vegeta, while moving to his side, says that unfortunately, that was the only way to deal with that monster, and he states he would have done the same at the end of the fight. But he changes the subject, stopping talking about Brawly and starting to talk about Beerus. He says that their suspicions were correct, and that the Beerus of this world truly seems to be stronger than the version in their world, since their world's Beerus probably wouldn't have defeated Brawly with such ease and calmness, especially a version that seems to be even more powerful than the one they know. Goku agrees, but instead of worrying him, it only makes him more excited. Despite his fear, Yamoshi tells the Destroyer that he is prepared to fight if he wants, but Beerus says that Yamoshi doesn't interest him, and that today he is there for these two visitors. Vegeta says he was looking forward to continuing their fight, but unfortunately was interrupted. But Goku says that this time, he will face Beerus, as Vegeta has just faced Brawly, so it's his turn. Moreover, in their world, he was the first to face Beerus, and ever since that time he has felt that they have unfinished business. Vegeta sighs a little disappointed, but he can't help but agree with Goku, so he tells him to do as he pleases. Beerus asks if they have made up their minds. The response comes from Goku who, while staring at the God of Destruction seriously, says that he will be his opponent, and that today will be the day he finally defeats Beerus in battle.